Our theme today is tomorrow's questions. And so as a teacher, I'm going to take Vihan's advice and talk about what I know, which is teaching. And so the question to be posed for tomorrow is how do we empower tomorrow's learners? Now, this is really a question that's been asked for a very long time. How do we keep kids engaged in the classroom? How do we empower our young people to go on and do wonderful things? And this question will exist until the end of time. But for now, here's my two cents on the matter. So it's important to understand that research helps bolster an argument. I teach argument here at Emerson in rhetoric and composition, and I teach my kids all the time. You gotta synthesize your points and corroborate your points with good, strong research. So it's important for me to tell you right out of the gate that for the sake of this presentation, there is none of it here, okay? There is no research in this TED Talk. It is purely anecdotal, okay? But in all seriousness, most of what is being shared in this TED Talk would be corroborated by many educators and research, and we'll get to more of that in just a little bit. So I gotta ask you a question first. Are you ready? Let me hear you one more time. Are you ready? Here's what I'm gonna do for you. I'm gonna give you five super difficult and emotionally painful rules for engaging today's learners. One more time, are you ready for this? Let's get it going. First, you gotta like kids, okay? Let's camp out there for a minute. And if there's any teachers in the room, feel free to say amen as we go along, okay? So, I told you, it might be a little painful. You gotta like kids, okay? How do we do that? This, this picture right here on your left is during a time that I lived in Africa, specifically Uganda, for about a year when I was 19. I was, you know, trying to find myself. And it was in Africa that I discovered I really like teaching. And it really happened in this room right here. This was a place called the Remand Home. These were young juveniles. They were in there for fighting. They were in there for stealing. Some were even in there for far more worse crimes. And I got to know them. And I got to teach them writing skills. And I got to teach some of them English skills and life skills like discipline and loyalty and punctuality. And it was there that I discovered I like teaching. I like teaching. Then I came home. And I didn't get a job as a teacher. I got a job at a place called the Dallas Morning News. But I knew a teacher. She was my wife. Her name is Rachel. And I would go to Rachel's classroom and I would read to her kids every now and then. And that's the picture on the right. And I discovered in that place too, I like teaching. I like being in rooms with kids. Here's what happened the first time I finished reading to Rachel's students. I finished reading the book and Rachel, my wife, she says, okay, Mr. Winnaker's going to stay just for a couple of minutes and you can ask him some questions. So sure enough, some kids line up. They start asking me questions. The first girl comes right up. She said, Mr. Winnicker, I got two things. First, the girl behind me, she loves you. Number two, you have chest hair like my dad. I'll see you. And then she just walked off. Okay. The next girl came up and she's like, Miss Winnicker has a picture of your cat, Lucy. I'm like, oh yeah, Lucy, she's okay. And she goes, I think you should move to Pakistan where I'm from, where there are probably one, no, Mr. Winnicker, probably two billion cats. And I said, that sounds horrible. And then... The last kid, as I was walking out of the room, hey, Mr. Winnaker, how much money did you spend on Mrs. Winnaker's wedding ring? And I said, no comment. And she said, my dad said he got his out of a Cracker Jack box, but I don't know what that is. And so it was in these two settings that I discovered I like kids, but that's not all there is to it. You know what I'm saying? So I do weddings, okay? Um, I, I'm a minister. I, I've done lots of weddings. I married my cousin. Pause. I'm not married to my cousin. Uh, I married my cousin and her husband. Pause again. I'm not, we're not all three married to each other. What I meant is I've performed their wedding ceremony, uh, and many others like it, and some of them religious, some of them non-religious, but I kind of have a go-to little thing at each wedding ceremony. And I tell this couple, who's standing right on either side of me, looking deep into each other's eyes, I tell them, Love, and I'm kind of being serious now, if we treat love like an emotion, it's probably going to let us down a lot. But if we look at love as a choice, then I think this relationship can succeed. In other words, you got to wake up every day and consciously choose to love your partner, to serve them, to lead them, to follow them, to hear from them, to listen to them. It is a conscious choice. 
And what we do as educators is no different. We can't just wake up hoping that we like kids that day, because we might not. Can we get an amen? <clears throat> but if you choose, if you choose to like kids each day, then you're setting yourself up for a win. In order to teach the best in kids, we have to see the best in kids. And let me tell you from a lot of years of experience, sometimes that doesn't come naturally. Sometimes you have to make a conscientious choice and say, I see you, I see the best in you, even though you're not showing me the best, and we'll do this together. We'll advance. You gotta accept that teaching is hard. Some of our new teachers really need to learn that, man. I don't know who told them teaching was easy, cause it ain't, okay? Like, duh, it shouldn't be, okay? So, quick story. I used to work at the Dallas Morning News, I mentioned that. My wife was a teacher at that time. I'd come home from work, it'd be a Friday night, and I'd say, honey, let's go get some pizza, I'm hungry. Or, let's, let's see what our friends are doing. Let's go to Top Golf. let's go see a movie. And she'd be like, okay, all right. Can we just like relax on the couch just for a minute? I'd say, sure, honey, that's fine. I'd turn on a game, I'd turn on a show, 7.30, roll around, 8 o'clock, 8.15, I'd look over, hey, Rachel, you, you wanna go get something to eat? And here's what I would see. Just passed out on the couch. And we would argue, I'd be like, Rachel, it's Friday night, I gotta feel like it's Friday night, you know what I'm saying? Like, we gotta go do something. And she'd be like, Kyle, when my brain tells my body that it's done for the week, the body kinda shuts down. And it was this fun little squabble we had for a lot of years. And then, I became a teacher. And the first Friday, of the first week I was a teacher, I come home and I wake up to this picture. Notice the timestamp, okay? And I look over and Rachel's sitting on the adjacent couch. Her legs are crossed, she's drinking coffee and she's looking at me like this. Hi. She didn't need to say I told you so, the look did it for her. This was the first Friday I was ever a teacher, and I was unconscious by 7.30 p.m. If I can get an amen from the teachers in the room, you got to accept that the job is hard. It's hard because we have decision fatigue. We make over 1,500 decisions a day on average, not to mention all the other stuff we do in addition to being a classroom teacher. And let me tell you something else. It's tough because it's challenging in every way something can be challenging. It's physically tiring. You walk a lot. I just close my rings every single day on this thing, being at Emerson, okay? More specifically, it's mentally challenging. I gotta write a lesson plan. How am I going to engage the students today? How am I gonna ensure that they respond the way I want them to? What am I gonna do when they don't learn the thing that I want them to do, right? It's mentally taxing. It's emotionally challenging. Sometimes a kid walks in and he has a bloody nose, or she has bruises on her arm, or they've just been dumped by their boyfriend or girlfriend. And you gotta sit with them, and you gotta comfort them, and you gotta work these things out. And all these things together make for a very psychologically challenging job. I get home and I don't know kind of where that boundary of work ends and family begins, where work stops and me outside of work starts. It's psychologically taxing. The best advice I ever got was from the best educator I've ever known. She's my best friend, and I'm married to her. <clears throat> oh, okay. Uh, and so she said, I came home from a hard day of work, and there was this girl. Uh, this girl's cousin had been murdered the week before in gang violence, and she kind of liked me as a teacher. She didn't like a lot of other teachers, but she came in just kind of seeing red that day, and she didn't want to hear from me. She didn't want to do anything for me. She didn't want to do that work that I had asked her to do. And she ended up cussing me out, storming out of the room in front of a class of about 32. And it was a hard day. I went home. I sat on the couch. I told Rachel, I said, I, I don't know. I, I don't know how to get through to her. And I cried. And Rachel let me cry. And then she came and sat next to me and she put her arm around me. And she said, you're going to pursue these kids like you can be the difference maker in every single one of their lives. And I love you for that and you should keep doing that. But Kyle, she said, I need you to know that do that, but you can't bear the emotional guilt, weight, and burden when you end up not being the difference maker in their life, or it's gonna be a long career. And then I said, okay, I get it. You're smarter than me. And then she said, then she said, you know how I know that? 
I knew you in high school, and I knew all the bad decisions that you made in high school, and look who you are now. Now, I'm nothing special, but I'm not that person. And that was her way of telling me, I have objective evidence that these kids can get their stuff together even when they're not in your classrooms. The best advice I ever got, but teaching is hard. It's really hard. We got two down. Here's number three. Compliance is not our friend. It's not the end goal, okay? Leave it for the dogs. Here's what I'm talking about. Compliance, for the sake of this conversation, we're gonna define it as such. Getting learners to do the things that we've asked them to do simply because we've asked them to do the thing. When was the last time that worked well for you? Okay, so what we wanna do as educators, we wanna slide over to the middle where we engage students. This is where we stoke a learner's psychological curiosity and cultivate an investment in their learning. And here's the money, here's the jackpot. If we do this well as educators, it leads to this. We empower our young people. This is when a young person takes ownership of their learning. They have agency, which is something we talk a lot about here at Emerson, over their learning process. So if compliance is our goal, how could we ever hope to engage young people? And if we can't engage young people, how could we ever hope to empower them? We can't. But if we get rid of compliance, hey, do this thing because I'm the teacher and I said so, but we work instead on learner-centered activities and we engage them where they are as young people, we can empower them. It's helpful to think about it like this. The student is the discoverer of learning. They should be uncovering the learning for themselves. That's how they become empowered. And the teacher needs to be the expert facilitator. Key word there, expert. Remember how we said teaching is hard? Okay, and that's gonna lead into our fourth point. You gotta be a lifelong learner. Cheesy phrase, but nothing ever truer has been stated. How do you become a lifelong learner? Well, here are some of the things that have cultivated my love of learning. Some of the books that I grew up loving, that I still love, that have informed my pedagogical approach in the classroom. Here's a wall full of people who've been doing it longer than me and better than me. And these are the best people to learn from. If you're always the smartest person in the room, two things are happening. One, you're probably wrong. Two, that's bad practice. You should surround yourself with people who are better, who have done it longer, who have some years under their belt and understand what it takes to pursue young people like these people on this board. And God forbid, we learn from our own kiddos. Some of these kiddos right here in these pictures that are sitting backstage that put on this event for you. They've taught me a lot about compassion. They've taught me a lot about kindness. They've taught me a lot about curiosity. God forbid we learn from them. It is tragically ironic and utterly preposterous for an educator to expect students to walk into their room and learn something without having that same expectation for ourselves. Let's move in to our last one. This is something that I say a lot in class. I was encouraged by a student this morning that I should get this trademark because it's something that we talk about a lot. We talk about taking things seriously, but not ourselves. Here's what it looks like when you take things seriously, but not so much yourself. You get a picture like this. I graduated with my master's degree three days ago, and I sent out a reminder to some of my students, hey, final projects do when you walk into class tomorrow, be aware. And I told them, as you can see on the side here, be sure as you greet me tomorrow to greet me as Mr. Wenneker, comma, Master of Education, okay? And then I get a text just a few minutes later on the Remind app from one of my students. Hey, Mr. Wenneker, is the persuasive part of the poster supposed to be a digital submission or on the poster or is it done individually? And then I said, gee, Mr. Wenneker, did you not just read the text that I sent? And then he corrected himself and he said, apologies, Mr. Wenneker, master of edu education. And my response was, good, good. And then as they walked into the room this morning, I had to remind them again, please remember Mr. Wenneker, master of education. This is what it looks like in a room where you're not taking yourself too seriously. Here is a paradigm that some teachers are bought into. I need to be hard and rigid and expect the world 
from my students. They turn it in at this moment because I said so, and it is going to be a high-achieving, high-accomplished class. And if the teacher doesn't fall into that category, they're over here. Soft and friendly, where the bar of expectation is set low because what I care about most is that you like me. This is a false paradigm. Teachers do not need to exist on one end of that spectrum or the other. Here's where we can exist, even within your own personality. We can take the things seriously, but not ourselves. What does this look like? We learn, we collaborate, we try, we fail, but we fail forward. We write, we think critically, we engage, and it is hard, and those are the things that we take seriously. But we don't take ourselves too seriously. We enjoy each other. And what does this get us? Students respond. They respond by achieving more than you ever thought possible. When they walk into a room and they feel safe and they feel comfortable to be the fullest version of themselves, you have unlocked the key to getting kids to learn in the classroom. And please take my word for it. It is beautiful. Not taking oneself seriously can do a lot of good things, but here's what it does the best. It emboldens our young people. It makes grown-ups like us accessible. They know about my kids. I make jokes with them. I send them weird pictures on the PowerPoint slides as jokes. It allows for true depth to take place, and it makes life and learning a whole lot more fun. You've been great, and I appreciate your time. Thanks.